uh, a couple of things. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash uh, We're on Vimeo where we post some of our talks right now. Uh, Vimeo.com slash uh, IRC, uh, RB on Freedom. Uh, and we have a Google group. It's a long URL, so just Google Philly RB <laughs> Google group. A um, couple of announcements, and if you guys have any announcements, uh, just raise your hand and you can do them. Uh, Software as a Craft Philly, uh, awesome new meetup. Uh, they just had their first one last month. Uh, they just opened RSVPs for August. I think Joe Moore, who's sitting over there, will be speaking on pair programming. I think there are nine spots left. So hurry up and RSVP. Uh, Philly DevOps is looking for a September speaker. I'll see if you guys do some DevOps and we'll talk. Uh, Meetup.com slash Philly DevOps. We are looking for a September speaker and speakers for the rest of the year. <laughs> so if you want to give a talk, please come talk to me or hit me up on Twitter. Um, next Thursday is uh, Code of Coffee, uh, which is a meetup in the morning at 7. I think we're going to meet at the new conference office. Okay. Uh, I think we're providing coffee now. So if you want to come to that, what's the meetup URL? Uh, Meetup.com slash conference dash code dash and dash call. Uh, it's Google, really cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, tomorrow we're actually hosting a uh, Girl Development Open Source Night. Uh, so if you guys folks want to come out and uh, TA some new programmers or come fuck them, uh, help them out, just uh, 12 to Chestnut at 6 o'clock, there will be snacks and stuff like that. Uh, any other announcements? Yeah? I'm just kidding. Uh, tonight, if you want to give a lightning talk, there are spots open. Uh, Brian's going to give one. And then we have the main speaker, Seth, awesome guy, thanks for coming. And we'll go to the bar after Ladder Christine. And I think we're going to meet with uh, the QA meetup. They go to the same bar. And it seems kind of cool. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so, any lightning talks? That's Brian. All right, Brian, you're up. So I just wanted to do a quick live demo on the little tool that I looked up over the weekend. Uh, I was working on a project that used RSpec tests and found myself typing RSpec tests <coughs> into one of the tests. I thought, isn't there a better way to do this? Isn't there a tool that flashes for files to change and runs the RSpec tests on that too? And of course there is. It's called Guard and RSpec. It looks like one of those pages. Uh, plug in for Guard, which is a general file watching tool. Um, and so I tried out Guard RSpec again, and I remember why I've always lost interest in it after I tried to use it in the past, because it's not really very good at any of the things it does. It's supposed to watch your files, but it's not very good at that, because it doesn't detect when you add new files. Um, it's supposed to selectively rerun the right tests, so it doesn't make any sense. But it's not good at that either, because it can fix the noise and the use of false positives. And as far as the output, it gives you it just dumps our specs output, which is really that big question. So I decided to see uh, how far I could get just sticking some basic tools together and throwing it with my own utility that specifically just to run our spec tests. 
Um, so I hope you guys can see the specs and the screens this one. So I'm in the directory of another one of my projects, which is a gen project. Um, and the tool that I made is called RSpec Live. And so you know, we can just uh, install RSpec Live. Or you can add it to your gen file. Um, but I've already done that in this project. So I have an RSpec test suite. And you can see if I type RSpec, there's 46 examples of passing. So if I type RSpec Live, uh, it takes over my terminal, uh, shows some of information there, and then it shows you the terminal of dust. Uh, that all goes into the team. Sorry. <laughs> you can, if you can turn these up too. Turn them up? Oh. I was <laughs> trying to figure that out. <laughs> all right, well, you can see. Good enough, I think. Uh, so I'm going to edit one of the Tests that's being tested in the resources. So let's see. So here's one of the tests, and I'm just going to change this expectation of two to three. So that should make the test fail. <coughs> Save the file, uh, and then there we go. So I have to appear right there in the uh, dots, and a little error message showed up. And we can't really see this red color because I don't know if you can see what that's being. Uh, but what you're seeing there in the output about the failure is you're seeing uh, a really abbreviated version of the stack trace for here. So you're seeing that uh, the first the first chunk there is the spec that failed. Uh, it's the spec line five. And then the next one, the next line in the back trace is seven, line seven in the same file. Um, and then you see the next piece of the backtrace, it just says jam our spec expectations. Because I don't want to see, you know, it's very rare that I want to actually trace an error inside of jam. Occasionally I do, but usually I'd rather just know, okay, when this code failed, it went into that jam, and then it went you know, somewhere else. Uh, so it kind of condenses all of that output into a jam, you know, file and then it was inside that jam. And then at the end it gives you the actual Expectation messages. Expect the three got to So for me, that's that's the information that I want when I'm trying to debug spec. So and by comparison, if I just type uh, our spec that he to get the backtrace for that in the test, I get all this junk, which is mostly stuff inside uh, our spec before you even start running the test, which is completely useless. Um, so our spec lab tries to show you something a little more complicated. Uh, and I've added some basic key commands here. Um, so I added a V. If you hit V, it changes the verbosity level of the uh, bat trace. So I hit it once, and it uh, shows the uh, function names or, or whatever extra detail on each of the one that was in the exception in the bat trace, which is sometimes useful. I hit it again, and it shows you everything, including the, uh, all the traces inside the gems and stuff, in case you want that. Uh, and then just can cycle back through to the lowest level, which is it just shows you expecting uh, the exception test. Um, uh, if you really want to see the passing tests, in addition to the failing ones, you can hit A for all. Uh, and there's all the tests in the suite. The passing ones are being dependent to the And the way I handle the fact that this doesn't really scroll, it's just a single screen console app. So what do you want to do if you want to start debugging one of the exceptions that's further down the list rather than the ones at the top? Well, you can just hit uh, end for next, and it actually cycles the order through. So if you have one one failure, you know, you don't have all turned on and cycle through those. Um, so you can just put whichever one you want at the top. So I'm going to make another test failure here. Now I have two failures showing me. If I hit end, it just stops and just cycling through. So you put whichever one you're working on at the top. We don't really need to do this for a long time. So that's what I put together um, in just a, a weekend using the Listen library that Guard actually uses on the hood to launch functions. Uh, it has no trouble. I don't know why Guard has trouble detecting the kind of bugs. Because using their Listen library works great. <laughs> um, 
So like I'll copy, let's copy, I'll just add a new spec to this new spec copy. So copy spec to two spec. And so immediately uh, the copy showed up the two extra things uh, and then if I remove it. Uh, uh, and so the next thing that I want to add to this is a smart way to choose which specs to be run. Because uh, if you ever use the RR spec, you have all these complicated rules where it tries to guess what tests we run. So if you change, you make a change to widget.rb, it wants to rerun widget spec.rb and nothing else. Which is almost always wrong because, especially in a Rails app, there's never, there's almost never a true dependence. There's always a dependence inside. Changing widget to RB is going to a bunch of, it's going to potentially affect a bunch of the same test. Uh, so what, what I want to do next for this tool is integrate with some kind of code coverage tool so that when specs are running, it just uses a basic code coverage analysis to see which files get touched when each spec is running, and then you know exactly which um, specs to be running. So for right now, it just runs all of them, so it's well suited to projects that have a fast running test. So we're probably not going to do that. But uh, you could do that if you just wanted to let it keep running while you were you know, coding on something else. So anyway, I would love it if people want to try this out. It's on Ruby Gems, um, RSpec Live, and um, give me some feedback. Let me know how you like to do it. Does it work with? Uh, Mini tests, spine tests? It doesn't, but I'm not opposed to expanding to do that. Um, RSpec is what I use currently. Um, I've been really liking the new RSpec 3 and I've been using a lot of projects. And it has a really clean API for hooking into the tests and to you know, custom format to, to observe the test output. So it was really easy to hook into RSpec 3 to get the data into this program to display the test results. Probably wouldn't be as easy with either an older or static or green test, but I, it could definitely be expanded to. Sure. Uh, <coughs> so, one of my biggest like, questions so far is like, if you're working on a test suite that takes like, like two seconds to run, it's not going to be clear rails out, and you're making changes and like, saving a guard that like, creates a queue of like, you need to run this test of test, like, how of fast. How are you handling, like, if there's a test we already wrote, can you save the file? Or does that just get put on the back? Or does it like? Well, so what I'm doing right now is I'm just trusting um, the listen library, because it you know, has a, you just tell it what directory to listen, and you give it, um, you know, a block that's going to call it when it gets changed. Um, and I haven't done enough testing to know exactly how it works. It seems like it doesn't actually just queue up a bunch of changes and keep on playing them. Once the loop comes back, it seems like it queues up the changes that happen while the loop is executed, while the block is executing, and then sends all those in one chunk. So that would kind of, that would kind of solve the problem on its own, but that's really what it does by the user's um, And it would be pretty easy just to build in some basic problem to keep it executing a bunch of tests in this case. So definitely don't have to do that. So, yeah, so that's something I should look at once I know. Um, you know, start making this really a uh, tool that's useful for slow learning. Um, okay. All right, any other lightning talks or things you want to share? Uh, two more announcements. I also forgot to mention where the bathroom is. The bath there's one bathroom around this corner. It's a single bathroom. If you walk all the way around here, there's the full set of bathrooms. Uh, we are also broadcasting the meetup via a live hangout. So if some of your friends wanted to see that, they could make it out. I tweeted the link or retweeted it. Uh, you can share that with them, please. Uh, all right. And now Zach Fargo will be speaking about DSLs. Uh, Chef is, I mean, uh, Seth is from Opsco. Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh. So, round of applause for coming down. Hi. Hi. 
got one. Oh, <laughs> Hi, Seth. Try this again. Hi, everyone. Hi. 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 Awesome. So, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, thanks to the guys from PropWorks for hosting me. My training got in like an hour and a half ago. Uh, it's not raining at Pittsburgh, so I'm going to say. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you about uh, kind of DSLs and the clean room pattern. Um, so this is a topic that I've been diving into pretty heavily. Um, I've been working uh, at Chef on a project called Omnibus, which is basically a full stack packaging framework, um, which is the software we use to bundle up the Chef client, the Chef server, and pretty much all the products we ship. Uh, so it's it's a way to create devs, RPMs, PKGs, MSIs, uh, full stack installers. So uh, probably the one you're most familiar with uh, is Vagrant. Vagrant is a full stack installer. It comes bundled with its own Ruby. It comes bundled with everything it needs inside a dot app. Um, that's the same way Chef is distributed. Um, <coughs> Omnibus itself is a giant DSL, much like Chef uh, and Puppet, for those of you that work with those tools. Um, and uh, kind of this, this presentation and a lot of the changes I've made have been as a result of like, direct pains that have caused me problems in that project. So I want to talk about that today, um, kind of share some of those, and hopefully we'll learn a lot about DSLs. So that was fast. Go back. So my name is Seth Margo. Um, that's me on Twitter and pretty much everywhere on the internet. Um, you should follow me on Twitter. If you like my code, you should follow me on GitHub. Um, I'm a release engineer at Chef. Um, that's probably different than a release engineer everywhere else. Um, we work primarily with build systems, um, but we're not like button pushers. Uh, and I'm also a Ruby developer. Um, so I was, I was a Ruby developer. I was a Rails developer um, for probably about nine years now. So I've been doing this a while. Um, Shop is written in Ruby. I write lots of Ruby. I sometimes write Node.js and other things, too. But we don't want to talk about that. This is a Ruby um, So I've said DSL like three times, and now I kind of want to define it for those of you that aren't familiar with it didn't want to ask. Um, <clears throat> before I go any further, I like interaction. So like, if you have a question or something I said that doesn't make sense, please ask. You can interrupt me. I used to teach undergrads, so like, I'm very used to that. So feel free to like, interrupt me if you have a question or a comment or anything like that. So a DSL is kind of an acronym for a domain-specific language. Um, it's essentially a way for a programming language to define its own syntax in a file for accepting and setting attributes and defining the behavior of the system. So Sinatra is a perfect example of a Ruby application that has its own DSL. If you ever uh, work with Sinatra, you have git, and then you, you, know, you already have your HTTP methods like get or post, and then it accepts a parameter, which is the URL, then it accepts a block that gets evaluated whenever the router gets that URL. Um, <clears throat> get is not a keyword in Ruby. Def is a keyword. Get is not. And that's how you know the difference between a DSL, which is a domain-specific language, specific to Sinatra, versus a language keyword like def. Uh, that doesn't make sense. The easiest way to know whether you're in a DSL versus a language definition is if your editor highlights it, you're in the language. If your editor doesn't highlight it, then you're probably using a custom DSL and don't have the extension installed. Um, and it turns out that Ruby is actually one of the best languages, in my opinion, for writing DSLs. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is like the dynamic nature of the language itself, um, but you could make that same argument for Python, and I don't think it's as good at writing DSLs. The second is uh, the way that you can access and change Ruby at runtime, and specifically Ruby's object model around how eigenclasses uh, work, which I won't go too much into that, but uh, it's a super important thing to like how DSLs work. And I just have a question about DSLs. So the main difference between a DSL and a function instead of you're using blocks. You're going around blocks of. Um, <clears throat> yes and no. So uh, you don't necessarily have to be passing around a block. And we'll see some examples. DSL methods in themselves are actually functions defined on a class, but it's evaluated uh, like as Ruby. So uh, one of the examples we'll see is like there's a, a method called name. So in a Ruby class, you have def name and then like an accept value. But in a DSL, when you instance eval that, you just say name and like the value. Uh, and we'll look at some code examples. But every like every DSL method that you evaluate is actually a method in a file, but you're not calling the method. So you're not calling like class dot method. You're just calling the method, and you're using instance eval. Any other questions? 
So, <clears throat> oh, why I took a uh, So this is uh, so this is an example of a DSL. Uh, so this is just a straight up Ruby class. Uh, there's a name method which is accepting a value. So the first value here. Um, so the way this is working is we're defining a method called name, and it accepts kind of an optional parameter here. So in this case, I'm using like a constant called null instead of nil. Um, I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, and then we're calling this method called setter return, and basically you repeat this pattern for every every DSL method you want. So we have a name method and a description method. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you might want to use some meta programming to make this a little cleaner. Uh, and then typically you have some type of setter return. And the, the point of setter return is to inspect what it got. And if you're trying to set a value, uh, then you set it. Otherwise, you return the value. This is all done with instance variables. So basically what we're doing is uh, <coughs> we're checking if the value is null. And if the value is null, then we return instance variable. So instance variable get is a Ruby uh, meta programming method for grabbing an instance variable. And in this case, we're just grabbing at whatever the key is. So if we call the setter return on name, we would be getting an instance variable called at name. If the value is not null, meaning we passed in a value, then we're going to set that instance variable. So if it doesn't exist, we're setting it and creating it. If it does exist, we're overwriting the value. And we're using instance variable set to do that. Those are two uh, methods that are defined on Ruby's object class. So the reason you use null, is which uh, null is just like object.new.freeze, um, is because if you use nil, it's actually impossible to set a value to nil. Um, because you would always be comparing against nil. And sometimes you may legitimately want a value in your DSL to be nil. Um, whereas if you create a constant like null and set it to an object that you freeze, then you always know whether you're comparing against the original default value or like a new value the user is asking for. And <clears throat> to kind of break this down, if you didn't understand the code, this is what this would look like in yard dogs. So if you guys are familiar with yard, um, this is actually defining two methods. So the first is name with a parameter, which is going to set the name of the project and it accepts a string parameter or an object. I just use string here because it's the simplest. And it has another method, which is name with no parameter, that returns the value of the project or nil if it doesn't exist. So <clears throat> if this was a language like Java, this is kind of what we would be writing. Um, Ruby doesn't allow you to overload methods like this, but just to kind of make it absolutely clear this is what's going on, there's just some meta programming out of that. So if name's given a value, we set the instance variable to that value. If it's not, we return whatever the instance variable is. And instance variable is default to nil. So if this hasn't been defined yet, we'll get nil back. Where is it so far? So the basis, basis of DSLs. So if we were to run this class in a prior session or an IRB session, we would create a new project, and that would give us back some instance of a project, save that to a variable. And if we call project.name the first time, we would get nil, because that instance variable is nil. And if we run it again, and we said project.name and passed in a value, we're calling the setter with that method, and it's going to return that value. And now if we call project.name, what's the result going to be? Cam, right. So, Kind of, if you think about like this is this is straight up Ruby. You've all probably seen something like this before. What would this look like in a DSL? Well, if we take away the return values and we take away the prior session, uh, you have an instance of an object, and you're calling a method on it. You're calling a setter method on it. The difference between calling project name as we have here and a DSL is really just instance eval. So in this case, you're not calling project.name. You're calling name in the context of a project, in the same binding as the project. So these are implicitly the same. You're calling project.name and instance evaluating name. <coughs> the difference is that in a true DSL, you would not be calling project.instance eval. You would be loading some type of file on disk, like a, you know, a project.rb file that you would be evaluating. So this would probably be much longer. You, you're using instance eval under the hood, but you typically wrap that up in some type of logic. And that's your final DSL. So this is what you have in the contents of a file. So that's the quick high level, like 10,000 feet, Boeing 787 of the DSL. Questions so far? Lots of info, so you should totally ask questions. I was actually, I was looking at um, Shaft the other day, and I noticed that that's exactly what it's doing. The resources uh, are finding themselves useful. Yeah. 
Most of the software I've shot is developed <coughs> DSLs. What's the difference between consistent key value and key exact? So that's a good question. So <coughs> uh, it has to do with who is uh, receiving the binding of an object. So instance exact allows you to specify the object against, yeah, allows you to specify the object in which you're executing against. So instance eval self is essentially like the thing you're instance evaluating against. So if you call object.instance eval, inside the binding of that block, self refers to object. Whereas with instance exec, you can actually change what self is evaluated as. So you can you can call object.instance exec and pass in a different object to refer to self. So it's, it's kind of like the difference between uh, it's like in jQuery when you pass the you can pass a different uh, object to refer to this. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Where you can you're changing the function binding essentially. Um, it's the same as like kernel kernel dot exec versus kernel dot versus kernel dot system, right? Kernel dot exec replaces the Ruby process, whereas kernel dot system creates a subshell, the same type of uh, pairing. And six exec also is like relatively new. Um, I think it came in like Ruby one nine two. Um, it wasn't around in one nine one, and definitely wasn't around in one eight seven. Not totally sure on that, but I know it's like. It was definitely not in 1.8.7. So there's some cool things you can do with instance exec that you can't do with instance eval. Oh, yeah. So what one of those is, because otherwise it seems like why not just pass that second object as the object for instance eval. Same Sorry, we're, we're, we're digressing. I'll, I'll ask you later. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, we can talk about it later. Instance exec is fun. It's just slightly different. It's not actually the best thing to build DSL with, um, just because you don't have as much control over function scope, um, which we'll talk about actually soon. Um, cool. <clears throat> so um, this is what like a DSL file for our previous project implementation would look like. So the project class is going to consume this DSL. It's going to evaluate it. So it's important to, to Remember the distinction between parsing and evaluating. It's actually going to read this file as Ruby, uh, so it's not it's not going to do like a syntactic parsing where we use regular functions. It's actually going to load this file as Ruby and run it as if it's Ruby. So that gives us some advantages and disadvantages. Let's talk about the advantages. Um, if you were to ask what the name is after you set it, it's actually like available to you in this class. So I called name Hamlet, and just like we saw in the IRB session earlier. Like that value is now saved, it's persistent. And that means that we can use it in other things. So I've set the name to Hamlet, and now I'm setting the description to the interpolated variable uh, name, which is actually the same as basically saying a Hamlet. So you can do a little bit of dynamic programming here, reference other variables that were defined earlier in the system. Uh, you can have conditionals in here. So if you wrap the description block in an is false clause, the description won't be set. Because this is evaluated as Ruby, that the, the contents of that if block won't be evaluated because the condition is false. Uh, so <clears throat> if you look at the definition of instance eval, uh, instance eval evaluates a string or block containing Ruby source code within the context of the receiver. So there's like other junk that's not important to this conversation. And then it says the variable self is set to object while the code is executed, giving the code access to objects in the system. Um, and the important thing I wanted to point out in this definition uh, is this last part here, which is giving the code access to objects and instance variables. So <clears throat> if you think about DSLs and what we use them for, we are taking code that is written by someone else, usually, an, an external file that we're consuming from an external system, and we're giving it unfederated access to our internal representation of object, internal representation of state. Right? Ruby uses instance variables to represent state, I would say like 95% of the time. And we're giving arbitrary code access to that state, that state information. So let's look at why that's a really bad idea. So <clears throat> this is what a typical like load method would look like. So project.load, this is a class method, and it accepts a file path. Um, just grab the contents, grab the file name, and then um, for those of you that this is like my favorite Ruby thing to do. Um, so tap, is anybody not familiar with the tap method? It's the coolest method in Ruby. So uh, what it does is it takes the receiving object and yields it to the block. And then it returns the object that it yielded. So this is the same as saying, 
like instance equals new, instance dot instance eval return instance. Uh, <clears throat> it's the same number of lines of code in this case, but if you have a really long kind of thing where you need to manipulate various things, uh, tab is really cool. Uh, it's super useful on hashes. So you can do hash dot tab and then yield the hash and then conditionally set things. Uh, cool little Ruby trick. Uh, it just yields the thing you gave it originally uh, with anything set on it. Uh, the reason we drop the file name is instance eval accepts two optional arguments. The, one is the, name, the second one is the name of the file, the third one is the starting line number. Uh, <coughs> what this gives us is in the event there is a syntax error, because this is evaluated as Ruby or some type of exception is raised, uh, Ruby's uh, error parsing will actually intelligently say, like, it happened at this file on this line, which is super useful to someone if they make they raise an exception accidentally because they're calling a method on nil. Uh, it'll show you the line number that, that happened in the file. Uh, but we're just using file.base name to, to get that. Um, and this is what it would look like you know, when you use it. So maybe you call this on a dir blob, right? You glob over a certain directory and you load every file in there. Maybe you require the user specifically run this. But this is basically going to create a new instance of the project. It's going to instance eval against the contents of that, and it's going to return the resulting object. So I have some pretty pictures to make that easy. Um, <clears throat> you can tell I don't like words on my slides, like pictures. Uh, so <clears throat> from here on out, uh, this red block of Ruby, this Ruby code, this is the DSL file we're evaluating. The triangle is the parent class, and the instance is going to be a circle that we'll see in a second. So to make this graphical, what we're doing is we have this class, the class we call load creates a new instance of itself. The DSL is loaded into the instance. So the instance evaluates the DSL. It made more sense for me to say that the DSL goes into the instance. And the instance is polluted or changed with the contents of the DSL. Um, I saw a Steelers logo in there. Um, else Steelers logo. Classic. Um, <clears throat> so the, the contents of the DSL is altered the state of the instance. We haven't touched the parent class, and we haven't touched any future instances, but we change maybe the name, the description, some attributes on this instance, and that's what gets returned to us for later use in the system. And we, were, we repeat this process for pretty much every DSL that we want to evaluate. So if we take a real world example, like the Hamlet and the description that we had earlier, this is our DSL. Our instance comes from a new class. We load that in there, the magic happens, and now inside that project, so if we call project.name on here, we're going to get Hamlet back. Originally, name was nil when we created the instance, but since we evaluated the, the DSL and the DSL defines a name, we now have a name attribute on this project, and other classes in our system can call project.name, and they're going to get Hamlet back. This puts us in a couple, uh, you can call them security risks, or scope leak, or I call them binds because it's a Ruby joke. Um, but uh, there's four that I want, five that I want to talk about and four that we can solve with a clean group path. So the first one is method scope. Uh, and the truth is that because an instance eval, there is no method scope. So what does that mean? That means, I'm sure you're familiar with like protected methods and private methods. And if this was our project and you tried to call uh, you tried to call project.name, you would get like, you know, cannot call protected method name, cannot call private method description. But when you instance eval, honey badger don't care, all of that's public. And the reason for that is because when you instance eval, <coughs> you're basically in, inside of a method, right? So just like when you're in a method, you have access to all the public, private, protected methods, the same is true with instance eval. So we completely throw access control out the window. So it doesn't matter if your method is public. In fact, ironically, external users will have access to your private methods. But internally in the system, you may not, because you've declared them as private and you're accessing them kind of the Ruby way, the dot method. Whereas DSLs use instance eval, they have access to all of that. So whereas if you call project.name, you get your no method error. If you just run this code, project.instance eval, and you ask for the name, you'll get the value back. So this is a huge, I don't want to say security hole, but this is definitely leaking more information to the user than you would like. And as you can see in the second example, is that leads to scope creep. So either intentionally or unintentionally, there's a high probability for method collision in larger systems. So if you consider large systems like Chef and Omnibus, where there's hundreds of DSL methods, 
the probability for collision becomes incredibly high, especially as the aptitude of the developer writing the DSL increases. So that means the more clever the author of the DSL tries to be, the more likely they will collide with existing methods. Why is that a problem? Let's alter our project class a little bit. So let's say the name attribute, because it exists on disk, must be yeah, all lowercase and can't have spaces in it. So uh, if the value is null, we just return it. Otherwise, we downcase it and you know, do a regular expression sub for any space characters and replace that with a dash. And then in our set of return method, we call sanitize on the value we get back. So if the value is null, it just continues on the stack. Otherwise, we sanitize this value. So we sanitize when the method is set. So if we look at like our previous example, if I called name with like some string, the name would come back with like some dash string, all lowercase as you would expect. But let's say unintentionally a developer decides that they need their own sanitize method. And their sanitize method needs to upcase the value. This is super important for the context of their system, and they're using it somewhere else in the GSL. What is the value of name going to be? And if you're not aware of the system, meaning if you're just a DSL author and you didn't write the system, you probably don't know all of these methods. And the more complex a DSL and the more DSL methods it exposes, the higher the probability for this collision to return. So in this example, and this is actually the thing that bit me the most that caused me to make this talk, was I was making DSL methods in my files that were helping me, so for loops, helper methods, lambdas, and procs, that were named the same as private methods or functional methods that existed later in the stack. This one's very apparent to see, but can you imagine a situation where the sanitized method took three arguments, and I redefined it to take two? And now I'm getting undefined number method of arguments for sanitize line something in a stack trace can only be saw with gem. Like, this is coming from somewhere I don't understand. I'm getting exceptions from a project I'm not even working on. And tracking that down is incredibly painful and an incredible waste of time um, for both the author of a project who's trying to figure out why this is happening and you, the DSL author, trying to not stop on someone else's toes. Yep. So the, the life of the revit definition is not just for the scope of the instance about it's for the, it redefines the actual. No. OK. It is only for the scope of this instance about, okay. but we will see that in a second. OK, so that's a good question. That's actually more dangerous. Um, but yes, that's a great question. So just to clarify, the redefinition of this method only happens for this instance. So if you were to evaluate another DSL file, it's going to use the other sanitized method that's present in like the file on the project.rb file on disk. This is only for this instance. So line number three is useless validation. We remember from our definition before, giving the code access to objects and some variables. And as I said, most Ruby objects use instance variables to represent state. I would estimate 95% or higher use instance variables to represent state. Every tutorial, everything you look at, instance variables represent the state of the system. Instance eval gives you unfettered access to those instance variables. You can undefine them, you can delete them, you can bypass validation. So let's look at an example of that uh, validation bypassing. So if we look up, maybe our DSL only accepts strings. We only accept string types. This is a pure string-based uh, democracy. Uh, and we want to raise some type of exception. I just used error here, the a custom exception, unless the value that we're getting is a string. So this is our exciter return method that we had before. And if we're given a value, we basically need to make sure it's a string uh, before we set the variable. So as you might expect, if you try to say in your DSL name, set an object.new or a symbol, you're going to get an error. Uh, but because you have unfederated access to the instance variables, you can just set at name, knowing that Ruby objects store their state in instance variables, to a new object. And now whenever you call self.name, because we're only doing the validation on the setter, you're going to get back an object. And this could cause the rest of your system to completely blow up. So in this example, it's a bit contrived. But I've seen this happen where people name instance variables or local variables the same as a DSL method. And you're, you're your scope is creeping. You're bleeding into the implementation details of the system and ultimately damaging yourself. So you can envision a malicious attacker trying to do this 
hey, this is a DSL that's evaluated in like a Rails app and we're trying to change the behavior of the system, or this is completely unintentional, a developer trying to make his or her life easier and altering the state of the system in doing so. The fourth bind is class eval. <clears throat> and this is what you were referring to. And this is only achievable if you have a malicious DSL author. But it is possible to permanently change the behavior of a class in memory using class eval and DSL. <clears throat> so without going too much into Ruby's object model, uh, if I have a DSL method and I call self.class.instance eval and define a new method, that's actually going to create a new class method. So in this example, I've defined project.new method. So capital project dot new method. However, if I call clock eval, call the class, I'm defining a new instance method for all future instances of that object. So if I call self dot class dot class eval and redefine sanitize to return nil, in this example using the, the things we've already seen, every call stop going twice. Every call to name will return nil because it's going to pass through that sanitize method and just return nil. And this is going to happen for all future instances of that class until project.rb is reloaded from disk. So if you imagine a long-running Ruby process, something like Rails, something like Chef running as a service, this is actually a huge security loophole. Hopefully you're not running Rails and blindly evaluating DSLs, but it's definitely possible for this to happen. This, this one in particular can't happen accidentally, but it is possible for an attacker to change the behavior of your system. So I've done something silly and changed the value to nil. But you can easily do a class about to create a connection to an SMTP server to send out spam to thousands of people on your web server uh, just by creating a carefully crafted DSL. So in this way, DSLs are almost, uh, almost a way to reflect like cross-site scripting, but you're not scripting an HTML web page. You're actually scripting an in-memory Ruby object and changing the behavior of the Ruby object. So on one hand, instance eval gives us like this great power. We can change the state of the system. We can change the state of the object, set all these values just by reading a plain text file. But that same power brings these types of problems. So <clears throat> while you may think, like, oh, I'm just going to load this project from disk, and it's going to be awesome, uh, not everyone is like <laughs> awesome. Sometimes they're evil. Um, and you may be loading an insecure file or an untrusted file. Or you may just be loading a third-party user file that you don't know the contents of. Uh, and you need to account for that. So this is where the clean room pattern comes into effect. <sighs> okay. So if we refer to like the non-clean room pattern, we have Ruby, we have an instance of a class. We have a class, and we have an instance of a class. We load the Ruby file into the instance. There's no filter, and there's no guards. So we have access to all those methods. We talked about the scope feed. We're basically giving unfederated access to the internal object model of the system. If we look at the clean room approach, it's slightly more complex. So the clean room approach, we take that same Ruby DSL file, we have our same instance of our class, or we have our same class and our same instance of our class. But the instance defines methods that it exposes on the parent class. So the instance says, my DSL methods are name and description. The class then creates a dynamic instance for evaluation. So to run through that again, the class makes a new instance. The instance tells the class, hey, these are my DSL methods. The class creates a dynamic instance that only has those DSL methods defined. So only name and description are defined in this anonymous class that's created at runtime. The Ruby DSL is evaluated against this anonymous class that only exists in memory and never exists on disk. The anonymous class then proxies or delegates back to the instance that it received. So what does that mean? That means we have the first safeguard is that the instance says and declares, these are my public DSL methods. These are the only things you can call in DSL besides straight up root. The second is the dynamic class execution. So even if someone was able to alter the class in memory, it would not be permanent for the rest of the system, because this is a dynamic class that gets created at each new time we instance eval. So if you call instance eval multiple times, each time you create a new anonymous class. And the third is that it's a proxy to the instance and it uses public set. So even if someone was able to bypass both the first and second methods, they can only call public methods on the instance because we're using public set and Ruby 1.9 plus. So this is an interesting filter. There's three safeguards in place to make sure that the user or the DSL evaluation does not gain unfigurated access to the system. 
So this brings us to basically solving all four of those problems. You don't have the scope for you don't have access to the instance variables because the instance variables are defined here, and there's just, you know, in the instance, it's basically def some method at instance.public send that method. You don't have access to instance variables in here, you don't have access to any of that because it's all defined on the instance. This is a dumb object that only exposes the methods that you call on instance. Uh, when I originally wrote this, this actually inherited from basic object, which is the like simplest object in Ruby, but that didn't work because it turns out basic object doesn't define some of the things that you actually need to write a DSL. Um, so it does inherit from object, which is the second most basic thing you can inherit from, and it has like bare bones everything. If you define helper methods, they only exist on this instance. If you define instance variables, anything, they only exist on this instance. If you class it out, it only exists on an anonymous instance that gets cleaned up by GC, um, so it doesn't really matter, and that anonymous instance isn't reused anyway, so it doesn't persist. So what does it look like? Um, <clears throat> I really wanted a clean, Ruby-like, Rails-like way for this system to operate. I didn't want this, I don't want a developer to have to understand this. This is super complex, there's lots of errors, um, you probably wouldn't understand this chart if I didn't walk you through it, and I didn't want every developer to have to understand that to use the clean room. So I sought out to make a very usable clean room. So this is the non-clean room approach. We have our project, our DSL method, that calls setter return. The clean room is very simple. First, you include the clean room model, and then for each DSL method that you want to expose, you just call expose with the name of the DSL method. And the cleaner module wraps up all of the other logic for you. Uh, so <clears throat> that's it. Uh, it's about 600 lines of code. Um, that includes like tests and some other stuff, and handles inheritance and a bunch of other stuff. The other thing the cleaner does is it encapsulates the object loading for you. So you don't need to call project.load. When you include the module, you get a evaluate file method that takes the path to the file. It also defines an evaluate method that takes a raw block or raw string, and it does all of that in a clean room. So the code is available on GitHub. Um, I wasn't sure how much time I would have or what kind of questions there would be, so I didn't put any code on the slides. Plus, it's always hard to like see code and walk through code on the slides. Um, so the code is on GitHub. It's public. The gem is published. Uh, Ruby jumps over slash gem slash clean room. I'm happy to go through the code with you all. Um, kind of show you exactly what the anonymous class instantiation looks like. Um, but I wanted to kind of open it up for questions, see if there are anything, you know, anybody has concerns, questions, things you think I didn't cover before we kind of dive into that. I have no idea where I am on time. You're all the time. That scares me. <laughs> um, so with that, are there any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to show you really scary video. Let's see. I have a question. Yep. So just, uh, I mean, I want to say this, but uh, can you just go over again, maybe, like how it <coughs> prevents the case where you do a class eval and you start a, you know, a spam you know, function, basically. So <coughs> so in this is a dynamically created class, so it's class dot new from object. So the issue with like changing the state of the system is like, like this is pure Ruby. So of course you could do that. Like it's evaluated as pure Ruby. And the fifth thing that I didn't talk about that you're never going to be able to prevent against easily is like calls to system, calls to backtick, things like percent %x, things like creating like a net SMTP server, etc. What I was referring to in here is uh, when you call class eval and you permanently change the state of the system, so every new user who makes a request is making some type of, uh, you could build a DDoS bot this way. So if you have a Rails app that's evaluating a DSL like this, you could call class eval and have it make a, a get request 10 times to some website. And then every time a user visits the home page or does something like update their profile, they'd be helping you DDoS some other website. Um, it's about persisting it in the system. You're never, I shouldn't say never, those are strong words. It's going to be very difficult to prevent access to things like net HTTP, net SMTP, like shelling out to the system. I mean, you can undefine kernel exec, you can undefine kernel system, but uh, there are also valid use cases where someone might want to do that in a DSL. 
Uh, there are cases where like, I need to check if GCC is installed in a certain version, and I use system to do that. And I grab the standard out, and I parse it. Um, so there, there's kind of like trade-offs where at some point, um, that's not affecting me. Like That's not affecting the permanent state of my system. So it's up to the user evaluating that file to uh, verify the integrity. So it's the same if, if you look at like Chef Cookbooks. One of the things we tell people is like never blindly run a cookbook on your infrastructure, especially a public community one. Always go through the code. Because I can very easily write a cookbook that does like sudo rm-rf in a system call and completely wipe your hard drive. And if you don't go and look at the cookbook, look at the recipe, like you're not going to be able to prevent that. And you're consuming on what, like you're consuming third party code. Um, there's a really good uh, Ruby Gems talk on like consuming Ruby Gems. Like Ruby Gems are pure Ruby code and like they have the same problem. I can easily write a Ruby gem that like in the file, whenever you require it, does a shell out to like email me your Etsy shadow file, like your Etsy password for shadow files. So like you're I don't want to say never, but like I really want to say you're never gonna be able to stop that. It's gonna be highly improbable that you can prevent that from happening. Other questions? No other questions. Sorry. So, sorry. So, what does this jam guarantee you when you use it? Um, I mean, so what is the contract? If you can't prevent using the bad taste to be pressing the so so it prevents, you, it prevents you from unfederated access to the underlying object. So it prevents you from accessing the instance variables, accidentally overwriting methods, bypassing validation, controls the scope of the object. Um, it prevents you from altering the state of that object, and basically prevents you from doing things that you shouldn't be doing. Um, like at the end of the day, a hacker is going to be a hacker, and like I could totally inspect Ruby's object space and find things and like do things with them I want to. Like in the code that I show you, like I protect access to a variable, but like I could very easily grab that variable in the object space and have access to the instance directly if I really wanted to damage a system. This is like preventing people from stopping other MTPs. Um, and it's a it's a way to wrap up logic that I've seen in a bunch of different projects and a bunch of different ways to evaluate DSLs. Um, you're never gonna have like true security, especially with a language that's not strongly typed with a language that's interpreted like Ruby. But you're also not going to be able to write a DSL in a language that isn't exhibiting those characteristics. Yeah, so it's, it's mostly not about security. Uh, it's a more secure. Uh, I would use the word safe instead of secure. Yes. Is, yes. is what I would, how I would describe it. It's a safer way for violating DSLs. Um, it, it is more secure in the sense that you are protecting on, like, Accidental unfederated access, but ultimately you're evaluating Ruby code. Like it's not secure. You're evaluating third party code. Like that in and of itself is not secure. Cool. Is there a question? Alright, so let's look at code. <coughs> Only one person to you. Alright, cool. <laughs> So all of all of the slides are on speaker deck um, as soon as I make them public, they're uploaded. Um, so if you do you have like questions afterwards um, or want to go through the slides, um, it will be on speaker deck slash sub Argo. So this is the clean room. Um, and let's expand the whole version view here. So as you can see, there's like lib, clean room, this is a standard Ruby gem. There's errors, RSpec, and version. Um, and then there's some tests in here. So I'll go from like easiest to hardest. Um, so this is the error. So it's just a, a custom error class. It's super straightforward. But, um, 
cleaner, more grays, and an accessible error if you try to do something you're not supposed to. Um, so instead of raising like a name error and a method error, which Ruby was writing on its own, I wanted to really separate the fact that like this is clean room saying no versus this is me just undefining a method and hoping that you know what I'm talking about. Um, so there's a pretty descriptive error message that goes in there that gets spit out to the user if they try to access a method that they're not supposed to. Um, RSpec is totally unrelated to anything we've talked about. These are just two RSpec helpers that I decided to package. So if you do want to use the clean room in your, uh, you know, in your system, uh, require clean room slash RSpec, and you'll get these two matchers, be an exposed method on, and have exposed method. Um, so this is an easy way to check if an instance or a class or a method is exposed. Um, so kind of like nice RSpec -y helpers. Um, I didn't write many test ones, sorry. Um, and the simplest of all classes is the version, just one that And so now let's look at the clean room. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing is uh, meta programming hacks. So I override included and extended. So it doesn't matter whether you include clean room or extended, you're going to get the right class methods and the right instance methods. Um, so class methods are grouped into a module called class methods, and instance methods are grouped into a module called instance methods. So let's look at those first. Instance methods are easiest. Um, there's just two, evaluate file and evaluate, and they delegate to the class. Um, so the class, me class methods accept an instance and the rest of the variables, where the instance methods just call the class method on itself. Um, and that'll make more sense in a second. But if you already have an instance, you can call like instance.evaluate instead of creating a new instance and passing it in. Uh, it's like a little bit of shorthand. And those methods both return self, which is a little bit different from what the class methods do. So you can actually chain evaluate calls or evaluate file calls. So starting from the top, uh, the first class method is evaluate file. It takes an instance of the object to evaluate against and the file path. It's assumed that the instance that you're evaluating has like a type of clean room. So it assumes that you are like evaluating something that responds to the cleaner method. Uh, if you don't, you'll get like a weird Ruby error. Um, it's on my list to actually like do some type checking there. Same thing we saw, just different variable methods names. So grab the path to the file, grab its contents, and call evaluate, which is another class method. Um, and evaluate takes an instance and then arbitrary arguments in a block and creates a new clean room object and instance you call that clean room object with those arms in that block. So um, is the instance essentially the, the, the blue circles and, yes. the, and the, uh, the file, the, the red, red box? Yep. And the triangle is the file you're looking at, like the text of this file, basically. Um, so in, in like the examples I gave, instance, you could sub out in your head for project. That's an instance of a project in the, the slide examples. Uh, and then we're doing a clean room dot new. So the initialize method takes an instance, and then it evaluates the arguments in the block that it gave. And notice that that clean room is lowercase because it's actually a method, not a class. So we're calling method dot new. That'll make more sense in a second. And then there's two uh, class methods that get used in the instance. So the first is expose. That's the method that we saw. Um, um, on the last slide there, with we call expose in the name of the method. And it raises an exception if you try to expose a private or protected method. So if the method is undefined or if it's not public, you get a name error. Um, that's because it doesn't make sense to expose a private method in a DSL. It's not private anymore. So it either needs to be public or you need to rethink your API. And basically, that just pushes onto a hash. That hash is also public for a couple of reasons. Um, and that uh, helper method for the hash is just setting it to an instance variable and then calling from superclass or using an empty hash. I'll explain the from superclass now before we dive into like the method that I use for these twelve maps. Um, so from superclass is this really great method um, where Ruby has this uh, essentially instance variables at the class level. So class instance variables are not inherited upon inheritance. Meaning the at exposed method instance variable on a subclass is not shared with its parent. So what the from superclass method does is it accepts a name of a method and the default parameter 
And it basically says, if the superclass responds to that, get the value from the superclass, otherwise return my default value. So what this allows you to do is if you subclass project, you would still have the same exposed methods from project.rb. If you don't do this, the subclass doesn't have the reference to the exposed methods of the parent. So you would only be able to instance eval or evaluate the file against the exposed methods in the child, even though those methods would be defined with like method added, they exist on the class, they wouldn't be exposed. So this is like a little helper to grab the method from the parent if it's not defined in the subclass. And if the sub this like first check here is like to prevent infinite recursion, or if like this is self, just return default. But that's true only if those parent methods are not private. Well, essentially the code won't run if, like since this is happening at the class level, like the code just won't run if you call expose on a private method. Uh, it's interesting, I don't know what would happen if you called private in a subclass. I guess it would still work. So if you have a subclass and you made a public method that was public in the parent, private in your subclass, you would theoretically still have access to it in the DSL. That seems like a thing that you should not do. I'll wait for someone to open an issue uh, <laughs> before I tackle that one. So um, the from club subclass, superclass takes the name of the method, so in this case, exposed method, and the default value is just an empty hash. So if, if none of that made sense, this is what that method is. Uh, and don't subclass your data size. If you care about subclassing, then that's what you're doing. And the reason we do it is because otherwise we would be modifying the instance variable of the parent class, thus exposing methods that don't actually exist on the parent. That is in the <coughs> and this is a hash, so it kind of indirectly prevents you from exposing methods twice. If you call this back, expose multiple times, you're setting the same key and hash. Um, so let's look at clean room. Um, I can speak. I'm not going to speak. So the first thing you do is grab a reference to the exposed methods, so I call exposed methods dot keys. So get all the keys in the hash, and then I grab a reference to the parent. So if the parent class, or like if the, the parent defines a name, um, use that. Otherwise, use anonymous. Uh, if you don't assign a class to a constant, it doesn't have a name. Um, it's weird if you get a thing that has like a space. Um, so I use anonymous to kind of like, create that. And then here's where things get really tricky. Um, so I create a new anonymous class that inherits from object. So class.new, capital C, class.new, accepts optional parameters, one of which is the subclass to inherit from. So this is the same as saying, like, class foo extends from object, but foo is completely anonymous. So it's like saying class, like, nothing extends from object. And <clears throat> this whole, like, do n is essentially within the class definition. So the first thing I'm doing is on the eigen class of this class, on the eigen class of the class, I'm just finding class. Eigen class mean? Sorry. Um, <laughs> you use that term. So Ruby's object model is really complicated. Um, and I don't have pretty pictures to show you, but essentially you have, so you have your class, which is like the thing you just loaded, and then when you evaluate against the class, you're actually creating like an instance. You're creating an instance of the class object because everything in Ruby is objects. And then you, you create instances from your eigen class. So basically, it's possible. There's where you see like class and instance. There's actually like eigen class and eigen instance that live like in a vision shadow. And actually, everything you do in those eigen classes is like that's actually where you're operating. You rarely touch like the parent object. Um, this is. Basically the same, it's slightly different, but this is basically equivalent uh, to this. But because this is like a dynamic class instantiation, uh, like the, it doesn't actually work. And I don't actually do that. But you have to define it on the eigen class. So this is this is a fancy way of opening up self, and self is a class. And then the next thing we do is define a singleton or define a method called initialize. This is where things get really weird. So you define an initialize method. So this is the same as saying def initialize, which takes an instance as a parameter. 
And then we create a singleton method called underscore instance, or underscore underscore instance. Um, and singleton method is a Ruby 1.9 plus thing that creates a method on the eigenclass of this instance. So it will not exist for other instances, and it doesn't actually exist on the instance. It exists on the eigen of this instance. Um, and the way that you would do that is like you have to like create a method called eigen, like grab it. Um, and like it's not fun, but like, um, so that's why I define singleton method like this. I don't actually remember it off the top of my head. So I'm defining a singleton method called instance. And if you ignore like that a must call, I'm returning this instance. So there's lots of things named instance here. So the variable I'm passing in called instance is actually getting set on the singleton method called instance. So this is basically the same as this, except I'm dynamically passing in the reference to that object. Um, so the initial the initial pass of this and what you what you might think is like the right thing to do is to just set this to an instance variable. But the problem is we're instance evaluating this clean room object. So if you give people access to the at instance instance variable, you completely defeat the point of the instance eval. They can just call raw methods on instance and call instance eval inside your instance eval. So creating the singleton method kind of prevents that from happening. You never have direct access to the object, especially when you wrap that in this logic, which basically says unless the person who invoke to this method is me. So underscore underscore capital file is a, a Ruby constant that refers to the name of this file on disk. And caller is a Ruby method that exists on object that refers to the whole call stack of how we got here. So if the first thing in that call stack is not me, that means I was invoked externally. So that means someone invoked me in a DSL or someone called like dot send from a different system. So if that's the case, we raise an inaccessible error and don't let you access the instance. Otherwise, we just return the instance. So that's how you prevent access, or I shouldn't say prevent. That's how you mitigate access to uh, a protected instance variable. Because uh, I mean, this is a module, so someone can like in the inside of it, inside of another module define a defined method to undo this check, right? So the so if you define a method in your DSL called underscore underscore instance, yes, you could do that, and then you would not do anything. Oh, well, no, not in my DSL, for instance. Like, uh, so I was a malicious person, and I could uh, define a defined method. Um, I'm not sure how you, I, I, I thought that this was a module, so I thought that the defined method is actually just a, a function inside a module. So another module, couldn't another module just? Defined method is a Ruby as well. Like that's a that's a Ruby method. Oh, okay. Yeah, that exists on object. Um, and define singleton method also exists on object. That's the reason that it doesn't inherit from basic object. Those methods don't exist on basic object. So that's that's hack number one. If anybody has a better idea on how to do that, that'd be great. Um, but it works. Like there's test coverage and it works pretty well for making sure that you can't access it. Um, and then the next thing we do, this is kind of the bulk of the system here is for every exposed method, so every every method in that exposed methods hash, we define a method on this anonymous class. So we dynamically create this class. We're building it brick by brick. And that method basically accepts whatever arguments and whatever block we get it. It's just kind of a generic boilerplate and it completely delegates using public send to the instance. So basically what this class would look like if you were to somehow like print it out afterwards, it would be something like this. You would basically be calling instance public send. And this is what's going to happen for every DSL method. That you Uh, but that's all happening in a metaprogramming sort of way, so it's a bit difficult to follow, uh, especially since it's like using Ruby to define Ruby methods that call Ruby methods. Um, but these are these are like functionally equivalent when we do it in a metaprogramming sort of way. And then the second to last thing we do is define class eval um, on the instance. 
This is like self.classy val, not self.class.classy val. And raise an inaccessible error if you try to class eval against itself. And lastly, define a custom inspect method. So um, Ruby, by default, on classes, uses the name of the object as its constant. Uh, or the, con the name of the constant that refers to the object as its like, inspect method. But since this is an anonymous class, you get this really ugly string that doesn't really make sense. Um, so that's why we grab a reference to the parent and basically override inspect into s. So that when you do get an exception, it'll say, like, the parent class who did the evaluation with clean room in front So in our slides example, this would say, like, project colon 0x blah, 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 and then have clean room in parentheses. I can, I can show you what those errors look like. So this means when a user does get an error, maybe it's a deck error, or they you know, did something bad in their DSL, it's very like, clear that this is something that happened in the clean room, not something that happened in the, the actual class. So that's, like, the bulk of the logic. Um, it's really confusing. Uh, you totally get that, and it's really backwards. Um, but let's look at the tests. Are there any questions? So, if you look at the functional tests, um, it created this like anonymous class. It has a null object that includes clean room, and it has three methods: method one, method two, and method three. And essentially, uh, this just writes files to disk. Them. And you can see down here in the security section, if you try to evaluate something with underscore underscore instance, you get an inaccessible error. If you try to send underscore underscore instance, you get an inaccessible error. And if you try to class eval, even though class eval would technically not do anything, because this is an anonymous class that isn't going to exist the next time you evaluate even the same DSL. Um, you still get an inaccessible error, and we don't define that method. So we just make sure that the method was not actually called on the instance. Um, the unit tests are a little bit, um, a little bit more difficult to follow. Um, so we just make sure that the file gets read and evaluated in the class methods. And make sure that whenever you call expose, that those methods are in fact exposed. And you get name errors, try to expose public and, or protected and private methods. Make sure that the expose method is a hash. And then uh, make sure that the clean room is defining the delegate method that's on the proxy. So if you've ever worked with a proxy object, uh, clean room is like a subclass or of a, a proxy object. It's like a more enhanced proxy object or one more enhanced delegate class. Uh, to restrict access while it's more safely evaluating. Uh, and I can prove to you that these run. Because I could have just written them on the bullshit test and you guys would just be like, oh wow, well, these are just smart. Um, so they actually work, they run. Um, there's 42 examples, um, unit and functional. Questions? Yeah. Are there any like, performance issues with generating so many anonymous classes? Um, like, are they garbage collected? Like, so they're GC. Um, they're actually like they're pretty much GC the same way that like any other object would be, except the class is also GC. So like your class is never get GC because they're constants. Whereas like these anonymous classes get GC. Um, I'm sure there are. I don't know that like. I'm definitely sure. Like you're creating objects, right? Like there's a whole bunch of way to doing that. Um, I inspected the object space mostly to see if I could still get access to the instance while I was inspecting the object space. And like um, during the test suite, it creates like 40 instances of a clean room. And like I did a GC uh, sweep and like got rid of them all. So like obviously it depends on your GC tuning settings and all that. But like, yeah, you're creating a whole bunch of objects. But well, they are GC. Yeah, yeah, no, they're definitely GC. Cool. They're actually more GC in all the classes because they're not assigned to a constant, so Ruby's like, oh, see ya. Yeah. Can you show the class definition for me? No. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any questions about it, I just want to look at it. Uh, this part? Well, I do have questions about it, but I don't know. Like this part here? Yeah. I'm running Yosemite, so sometimes full screen. 
Yourself? I already talked about it. That's pretty obvious. <laughs> I, I wrote a little, I, like I wrote a resource recently, I wrote a resource provider, I suppose it's one that we're not spending that on. I'll just finish it up. But then it's consuming the GSO. Just a minor round. Sure. I wrote one for parsing it out, but it was a nightmare. Like the how like API, you know? Yeah. So like trying to create <coughs> classes based on the objects coming in and stuff like that. Um, but it's like mind bending to think about. Thinking about stuff. Yeah, I mean I'll definitely say that the number of people writing PSLs is significantly lower by like exponential factor than the people using them. Um, What's interesting is like the first time you write a PSL, like it's getting over your head. This is like the worst thing. No one should ever do this. Um, the, the other thing that I haven't mentioned is like there is another pattern for writing PSLs. That's a method missing pattern. That's what Braille uses for like most of its stuff. Um, the problem with method missing is like it's incredibly slow and you don't have the same flexibility. Um, Like Chef did that at one point, and like the errors you get are very obtuse because like, you may be raising something like non-explicit, whereas this is like very explicit, and you explicitly declare like this is my DSL, this is what it is. Um, it's also I found. Um, let me show you some other code. Um, so if we look at like Omnibus as a, a project, I can show you what. What this looks like to use in a project. So um, you can see, like, this looks very similar to the code that I showed you. There's a helper method to check if something is null, but other than that, it's pretty much exactly the same. Uh, and after each method, you just expose it in the DSL. And you can see this pattern. Um, you don't have to read all of this, but just you can kind of see, like, expose, expose. So basically, as a developer, when I read through this, as a you know, when I'm reading through the yard doc or I'm reading through the source code, I can clearly see, like, oh, this is a DSL method. And I may not know what expose means, but, like, I can very easily look that up and realize, oh, this is a cleaner thing. I don't understand that, but I know that this means I can use it in my DSL. Whereas if we get down to, you can see the DSL to me. Um, when I get down to here, and I use yard groups here, um, this is where the public API starts. So this is still a public API. You can call project.filepath, but filepath is not exposed. So filepath is not actually available in the instance. And you could define a method called filepath, and that's not going to persist on this. It's not going to have any effect on this at all, actually. Um, obviously, there's like comments in here. Uh, so like load dependencies, dependencies, a lot of it's like really bad merge. Uh, config files, extra package files, like all of these kind of traditional getter methods, these are all public, but they're not part of the DSL. So you can't call dirty in a DSL. But you can call project testers from within Omnibus. So it's about what's public to the user, public facing, versus what's a public API internal to a project. And what promises do you make to the user and to the developers or consumers? Yep. Um, I made a project I've only tried to make this on this page just for myself to use. Was using it just on the full body method. And what I found was it very quickly got very complex. And it was very difficult to find the method. The name of the method was code, and it all just ended up being more complicated than you get. How bad is the code you get when you get that 600 methods? So if you're using like method missing, it becomes really hard because it's like if it matches a certain expression, you just saying, oh, let's do that thing. Whereas like in an omnibus, they are actual methods. Like def name is a method, it's in the class, you can grep for it, you can search for it, and it's 
exists in a Ruby tree depends on how you define your DSL. So like in the, in the case of Omnibus, like yes, this is the, um, yeah, it's over a thousand lines of code. But like I can very easily search for like depth description, like I'm immediately where I need to be. So like the methods are defined. Whereas if you talk about like a um, your traditional like method missing thing where you're like if m matches like bar, right? So if it matches like foo bar, then you want to like do something crazy, else if it matches like I don't know how you define your DSL, but this is kind of how it works. Um, <coughs> especially for like dynamic binder methods. Um, it's really hard to figure out what's going on. Um, especially if you're calling like other method with like dollar one dot g sub like anything that's not a space character with an underscore. Like nobody in their right mind understands what this is doing except the person who wrote it. And I just wrote it and I don't actually know what's doing. So yes, you can make really complicated DSLs. But the approach that the clean room pattern, I guess, uh, advocates is that like you have a Ruby class and it's a public API and you expose various methods as setters, getters, or getter setters. Um, and you use the exposed methods to make them available as part of the DSL. And in doing so, you get the evaluate file and evaluate methods. But I, like, I've worked with both. Um, I think this is, in my opinion, a much cleaner approach. It's much easier for me to work with. I have less headaches now that we moved to this approach. I think we've seen more community contributions because it's easier to understand the code and kind of what's going on. And you don't really need to know how the theme room works. You just know that if you want this to be a DSL method, I have to type expose colon name at the end of it. You don't have to worry about like, anything. Like that. So it's, it's opaque and transparent at the same time. Any other questions? Go on. All right, cool. So if you do come up with questions, uh, feel free to email me, hit me on Twitter, uh, at Seth Margo. The code is on GitHub. It's something I said but didn't actually show. So you go to GitHub, um, and providing you have internet, and you go to GitHub and you go to the Marco slash clean room, uh, the code will be there, I really promise. Um, I, I put it up there earlier today. Uh, and it's on RubyGem. So please try it out. Open issues if it's broken. Um, and I'm interested in hearing your feedback. I think this is totally stupid. Um, please let me know. If you think this is totally awesome, please let me know. Uh, if you have any speaking tips or anything that you didn't like about the presentation, let me know. Just talk to me. <laughs> I don't have friends. Please <laughs> <laughs> uh, start baseball team sets. <laughs> that, no, that's my number one argument against the uh, like Flyers fans is that my tickets are not all it's not free. <laughs> <laughs> My ears are nine dollars cheap, but that's about it. <laughs> there was a there was a point in time where at PNC Park the tickets were cheaper than that one before you purchased them. There's always that. Cool. Alright, thank you. Well then.